reality of the situation for those are that they are the markers of the end of a liturgical year. And so we are called to look back upon the year that was, to go all the way back to Advent the previous year and to look at Advent and to see how God has been in control and to see at the baptism of the Lord how God has been in control. To see Lent when we realize our own mortality and then we are given new life with the resurrection come Easter. And then Pentecost, we know that the Lord is constantly with us and in control through the power of the Holy Spirit. And then in ordinary time, which is the liturgical year, and it seems kind of boring to call it ordinary time, and the reality behind that is it's not boring, it's that God is with us in the ordinary things of our lives. And then today we end with the reign of Christ, the reality that God has always been in control, and it's time to start to look forward. And so next week we'll begin the Advent season and our church will look different. We'll have Chrismon trees. We'll begin to see greenery. We'll begin to see poinsettias in a couple of weeks. You'll probably have some presents under your trees. And things will change. So today we look back a little bit. And one of the ways that God invites us to look back is to ask questions. And to give us invitations. So let's listen for a word from our Lord through the gospel writer of John as Jesus asks us a question and some people respond with their own questions. I'll read from chapter 7, verses 37 to 44. On the last day of the festival, which is always the great day, while Jesus was standing there, he cried out, Let anyone who is thirsty come to me. Let anyone who believes in me drink. As the scriptures has said, out of the believer's heart shall flow rivers of living water. Now he said this about the spirit, which believers in him were to receive, for as yet there was no spirit, because Jesus was not yet glorified. When the people had heard these words, some in the crowd said, this is really the prophet. Others said, this is the Messiah. But someone asked, Surely the Messiah doesn't come from Galilee, does he? Has not the scripture said that the Messiah is descended from David and comes from Bethlehem, the village where David lived? So there began division in the crowd because of Jesus. Some of them wanted to arrest him, but no one laid their hands on him. This is the word of the Lord. Thanks be to God. Every year around this time, it's one of my favorite times, not because it's about to be Christmas or Advent, but because we're finishing up elder training. And I get to read these really wonderful statements of faith. They have been, the five elders who are coming through each year, they have been through a rigorous training and spent eight plus hours with me, which is enough training in and of itself. They have read books, they have had to take quizzes, they've had to do homework, and then on top of that, I say, you have to write a personal statement of faith. And I love this part because it makes them a little bit uncomfortable, but also it makes them dig into who is God, who is Jesus, who is the Holy Spirit, what is the scripture, what are the sacraments, what do we believe about sin? And out of it, they start to tell a little bit of their own personal story. It never fails that at least one elder in each class says, Apostles' Creed is my statement of faith, signed, sealed, and delivered. It's on page 35, as you say every Sunday in the hymnal. What's next, Ben? It says everything that it needs to say, Ben. You can't add to perfection, can you? Well, no, you can't add to perfection, but... The apostles wrote that, and I don't mean to bring you down a peg, but you're not the apostles. I know part of it is a desire just to be done with the assignment, right? Whether we graduate or not, we're always trying to get done with the assignment. But I also think there's a deeper reason why we struggle with the personal statements of faith. It's hard to bear witness to your faith. 
Maybe it's easier to say it, but then Ben makes you write it down, and, and then people disseminate that, and other people can read that, and what if we say the wrong thing, or, or what if we don't say enough, or, or what if we're way out in left field, and someone says something about that? It causes us to worry a little bit, right? To almost paralyze us. What if we say, surely the Messiah can't come from Galilee, can he? What if we're the modern day versions of these folks in the scripture we read today? They had seen Jesus perform miracles live. They had heard his life-changing sermons. They had witnessed him healing the broken and the ill. And they said, that's not the Messiah. Maybe it's just easier to be silent, right, than it is to step out in faith. The Apostles' Creed is perfect. Why add to anything beyond perfection? Stepping out in faith means that you might take a bad step. Hurt your own ankle, let alone your proverbial ankles of your egos and other things. I'm not sure if it helps. No one has told me it hurts them, but I try to tell each of the elders that I've been in their shoes. I try to soften the personal statements of faith and say, you're going to have yours read by the most gracious, wonderful group of people in that session room who are going to love everything you have to say, mainly because it's amazing and it's personal, it's wonderful, and also because they're slightly afraid that I, as the moderator of the session, are going to call them out and they're going to have to speak if they say anything. I also tell them that I had to stand in front of a group that wasn't quite as gracious and nice when I was trying to graduate from seminary and become ordained. I was surrounded by a group of pastors who have this unwritten code that says, if you've made it, you got to haze the ones that haven't. And so I was in a room smaller than the session room, and I had to preach a sermon for these folks, and then I had to read my public, personal statement of faith. I began as I always did. I'm going to read some scripture. Would you open your Bibles, because they all had their Bibles? Will you hear the word of God? And then I read the scripture, and I preached what I thought was a really good sermon. I had prepared. They were all engaged. But here, the Word of God launched the great debate of 2008 in Denver Presbytery. Someone after the sermon just looked at me and, and he did that lean thing, you know. I, I just got to say it. You said, hear the Word of God. I feel like that's a little too authoritative. I like to tell my congregation to listen. It's more inviting. Okay, is what I said. For the next 45 minutes, everyone around that table except me debated hear versus listen. I didn't say a word, and this was wonderful because they had me for two hours. I had preached for 15, 20 minutes, and now they were wasting all of my time, and I said, keep going, keep going. Finally, one of the pastors who was not on what I would call Team Ben spoke up and said, I hear what you all are saying, and I'm trying to listen to your words, but I think we need to move on. I really think we have beaten this one almost to death. And then he gave me a wink, as if to say, you're welcome. Now, you may not know this about me, but I am a horrendous winker, and my whole body gets into it. And so I winked back at him, and the whole table was like, what is, uh, something's going on there. And he said, no, nothing's going on. The reality of the situation is we have spent so much time on something that really and truly does not matter, and we are missing the point that Jesus is in the midst of us. Ben is being called into ministry. We are all ministers, and we're arguing about hear versus listen. The Lord is amongst us, and we're talking about something over here. I think the man who uttered those words, surely the Messiah can't come from Galilee, was probing with that question. I think he was gauging the crowd that was all around him. It comes across as a derogatory statement when you look at it in the Greek and you sort of listen to it. It's a put down to that region from which Jesus was raised. Galilee is a backwaters region of the former northern kingdom of Israel. Jerusalem is far away, so it's, it's not important, so it's a knock on that. 
So when he says those words, when he asks that question, he wants to see if others are thinking the same thing that he is, and then maybe they can quickly dismiss Jesus the way we do sometimes and say, oh, he's from that part of the country. He can't be in leadership. I also think it comes across as a tepid attempt to end the debate about who Jesus is, right? Some people are saying he's a prophet. Some people are saying he's a Messiah. But as the scriptures say, the Messiah has to come from Bethlehem, not Nazareth where Jesus is from. This guy, he's disqualified because he doesn't fulfill the prophecy. Now, we are good biblical historians, right? And we know this is a flimsy argument. And so I think that's why he asked this question, because someone could just yell out from the back, Jesus was raised in Nazareth, but he was born in Bethlehem. Know your history. I think that man knew something about that. He just wanted to know if he was the only one who has what I would call a doubtful faith in Christ. He's standing in a group of people that are all probably thinking, it's crazy to think this guy's the Messiah, right? There's no way he can be the savior of the world, right? It's as if he's hoping and praying and launching this question out so that someone will tell him he is wrong and he's not the only one who's beginning to see Jesus as more than a backwaters nomadic preacher who's slowly transforming the world. Maybe this is the Messiah? But can he really be the Messiah? This isn't what the Messiah is supposed to do and to look like. He's not supposed to hang out with these people. He's supposed to be with those people. And so he asks this question, surely this can't be the Messiah, right? The Messiah can't come from Galilee. I was thinking about this question because I was remembering one of my favorite memories from being a youth director in Nashville. We had a group of students who were a big part of our youth group, and they all went to an all-women's school, and they had to do a senior speech in order to graduate. This was a great way to show up and to show support and to try to make them giggle from the back row. One time, there was a quite memorable experience that had nothing to do with the youth and everything to do with the speech teacher. She stood up first before anybody else spoke and said, we're having a little issue that I'd like to correct. It seems that every one of you who stands behind this pulpit likes to end their sentences with what I'm going to title a roller coaster inflection. So every statement becomes a question. For example, I was practicing with one of you and you said, I'm Rebecca Stevens and I've always had an interest in writing. So are you, Rebecca, and are you interested in writing? I was dying of laughter in the back row, and I probably shouldn't have been laughing, but it was really funny, and I thought, man, high school students, they got so much to learn. They'll get better, won't they? Those roller coaster inflections, as she called them, are our way of sharing our doubt without fully committing to it, right? Right? By sharing our doubt, oh, surely he can't be the Messiah because the Messiah is coming from, not from Nazareth. It's it's a question and it allows ourselves an out, right? Someone calls this man out and he says, oh, I was just asking. I was asking for the crowd. It's a challenge to be bold. It's a challenge to make a statement that doesn't have a roller coaster inflection. Sure, it's easy to make inflammatory remarks and watch how people react. Just look at our culture. It's a challenge to be bold in face-to-face interactions and not looking for likes on Twitter or likes on Facebook or Instagram. It's a challenge to be bold when your life depends on it. But that's exactly what we're called to do. To come to Christ because we're all thirsty. To put our lives on the line and to believe that Jesus can give us that eternal water. Maybe we're not putting our lives on the line in the sense of going to the firing squad or literally dying, but in a way where we are open to seeing that Jesus is challenging how we live the life that we're living. Daryl Davis, whom some of you may have heard this story on the radio, some probably have never heard this name before. But he didn't know that he was being called to put his name on the line, his life, in fact. He only thought he was going to play the piano at the Silver Dollar Lounge. 
It wasn't until after he had finished that set that his life changed forever. He finished his set and he was coming down to get a drink of water and a white man came up to him and said, Daryl, I've never heard a black man play the piano like that. When did you learn to play like Jerry Lee Lewis? Daryl kind of laughed and drank a little bit of water and he said, well, you do realize that Jerry Lee Lewis learned that from the boogie woogie style and from Fats Domino and other people and the man said, "Mm mm-mm. No, Jerry Lee Lewis invented that. There's no way a black man could invent that. Daryl said, can we get a drink? And the man said, yes, that's, that's, that's great. Let's sit down and have a drink. He knew that something was changing in his own life. And finally, the man looked at Daryl and said, I just got to be honest with you. This is the first time I've ever had a drink with a black man. Daryl thought this was hilarious because he thought he was joking. And the man said, it's because I'm a member of the KKK. And Daryl also thought he was joking. Who announces to a black man that you are a member of the KKK? And then the man showed him his card that says KKK and the man's name and his picture. Daryl stopped laughing. And they talked for about another two hours. And in that moment, Daryl's life changed forever because he realized that he was being called to do something that he never thought he would do, and that was begin to write a book about interviewing members of the KKK. This just flummoxed the interviewer as I was listening on the radio, and I was intrigued as well. You wanted to write a book about interviewing KKK members? And he said, yes. How do you do that? The man asked him. And Daryl said, I learned more about the Ku Klux Klan than I think anybody in the history of that organization. I knew their history. I knew their beliefs. I knew their leaders. I knew where they met. I knew everything. And what was happening was he realized his greatest weapon was his knowledge. They may not like him or think he's a less of a person because he's black, but they respected the fact that he knew their history. Because of that day in the Silver Dollar Lounge, Daryl has helped 200 men give up their robes, as he says. He continuously calls them and invites them to talk to him about their lives, and he shares his life. And in fact, he has multiple KKK robes in his house as a memento to show people who come over that you too can change. The interviewer was still stumped. How do, you, how do you do this? I was stumped as well. And Daryl said, it all starts with a question. Will you talk to me? Will you share your story? Will you listen to my story? And he says, it's not one conversation. It's usually 10 to 15 conversations and you start to chip away. You start to chip away. Our whole scripture passage this day began with somewhat of a question. Jesus is asking anybody in the crowd, are you thirsty? And that question is probing. It's a probing question from the Messiah that can be answered by anybody. Black, white, member of the KKK, Jewish, Christian, Duke, North Carolina, NC State, ECU, anybody can answer that question in the affirmative. Yes, I am thirsty. And because of that answer, that's why our questions happen. Because it's so open-ended, it's so inclusive. We start to wonder, surely the Messiah can't come from Galilee. If Jesus is going to welcome all of us, I don't know that I'm okay with that, to be honest with you. we got to discount this guy, but if he's right, I just want to know. So today you're being asked to share your doubts. Where do you doubt? Where do you struggle with your beliefs? And where might you run up against a wall if you were asked to write a personal statement of faith? The reason I love this time of year is because I get to sit with five beautiful statements of faith. They are deeply personal and they are faithful. They are honest in the way that they reveal who the person is and their lifetime of what I might call a doubtful faith. It is solid, it is secure, but it is human. It is who we are. 
Each of them, like me, probably wants to be really bold, but it's really hard to do that. We want to be firm in our faith, but then life happens and it shakes us to our absolute core. We want to follow everything Jesus tells us to follow, but that might require us to change our minds. And then we become a high school senior and we said, maybe later, Jesus? And that's why today is called Reign of Christ. Because there's always going to be a Christ who's going to continuously be in control. And he's going to say, are you thirsty? And when we ask questions, and sometimes they're roller coaster questions, and sometimes they're bold statements, he's going to say, keep coming. Come to my table. Come to my font. And taste the eternal water. May God bless this witness, and may God bless this congregation. Amen.